Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight. We have a great program prepared for you and we're so happy that you can join us. So let me start off with an introduction. Um, my name is Vivian Lee and I am the Bronx Community Organizer for Plant Power Metro New York. Um, Plant Power Metro New York is a community-based organization committed to our collective health empowerment through whole food plant-based nutrition which is an evidence-based approach to nutrition that can prevent, treat, and even reverse chronic illness. And while we miss so much offering these live sessions um, in this time of uncertainty, we have resorted to um, presenting webinars and um, to continue building community around health and nutrition. And we're offering this as an ongoing learning series um, during this time. Um, Feel free to add uh, your name, your location in the chat box below. And we will be taking questions after um, the presentation. So I will be um, referring to them so that our speaker can answer them. And as a reminder, please keep yourselves muted so that way we can minimize the distraction. Um, I'm honored to present our speaker today. Um, I have a personal relationship with him because uh, he's my trainer and I, he's the one who actually introduced me to the whole food plant-based nutrition. So I am forever indebted to him because it's changed my life. Um, but to give you a formal introduction to um, uh, Forrest, Forrest Nash is a certified personal trainer, fitness nutrition specialist, and holds a certificate in plant-based nutrition from Cornell University. He is a lifelong vegetarian and has followed a whole food vegan diet since 2015. Forrest has been pursuing strength training for the past 14 years and has worked as a personal trainer and online fitness coach since 2014. He is also a member of Team Plant Built, the largest, uh, he's also a member of Team Plant Built, the largest organization of vegan strength athletes in the world and is a two-time natural bodybuilding champion in the men's physique di division. He currently lives in Melbourne, Australia, and coaches clients online worldwide. So welcome, Forrest. We're happy that you can present for us. I'm going to um, allow you to, if you want to uh, give an additional introduction of yourself, uh, in the meantime, I will share the screen. Well, well, thank you so much for that introduction there, Vivian. Thanks for having me today. I'm really happy to be here. And yeah, I think you covered it pretty well with the introduction there, so we can go ahead and jump in whenever you're ready, because there is plenty to talk about today. So yeah, just to kind of jump right in here, as Vivian mentioned in the introduction, I have been a plant-based fitness and nutrition coach for a number of years now, and I've had the privilege to work with clients from all over the world, different backgrounds and walks of life. And of course, when people come to me for coaching, they have a lot of different goals and variety of things that they want to achieve. But I have to say more often than not, what it all really boils down to is going to be two things. And those two things are they want to feel better and they want to look better. It's pretty straightforward. And the way we do that is by having more muscle and less body fat. And so that's what I help them do. That's what I specialize in. And that's what I'm going to be talking about here today. And the good news is nutrition is actually the most important factor for doing both of those things and a whole food plant-based dietary approach is a fantastic way to go about it. So let's go ahead and get started. This is just a quick overview of some of the stuff that I'll be talking about today. So we'll be going over energy balance, losing fat versus gaining muscle, talking about macronutrients, tracking your progress and how to do that. And then we have some specific tips for fat loss, a sample meal plan for fat loss, tips for building muscle, and then there's even a sample meal plan for that as well. And then we will have plenty of time for Q&A at the end. This is going to be a fair bit of stuff that I'm talking about, so it may go a little bit longer today. But again, if you do have questions, please do stick around. We'll try to get to those as many as we can at the end of the talk here. Before we begin, though, there's just a little bit of a disclaimer that I have to make. And basically, it's this. If you just want to be healthy, live a long time, fuel your body optimally with a great density of nutrients, minimize your risk for chronic disease. You don't have to worry about all this stuff that I'm about to talk about. Just eat a whole food plant-based diet, get some regular physical activity, and you'll be on track to good health. And when we say a whole food plant-based diet, of course, we mean a diet that consists primarily of unprocessed plant, food, plant foods, 
So things like, you know, whole grains, your legumes, fruits and vegetables, nuts and seeds, things of that nature. If you follow that dietary pattern, eventually you should move towards and maintain a healthy weight over time. But of course, we all have slightly different genetic makeup. And so for some of us, that healthy weight might be a little bit lighter. Some might be a little bit heavier. Some of us are going to be in between. The good news though, genetics does not equal destiny. So whatever your starting point is, there is a lot that we can do to really build muscle and lose fat and maximize your potential for having a great physique. In order to do that though, we do have to get a little bit more strategic with how we set up our diet and lifestyle. And so if you wanna learn how to do that, keep listening. And if you want an example that it is actually possible to build muscle and get in good shape on a plant-based diet, even without having the best genetics in the world, well, you don't have to look any further than myself. So this photo right here was from back more towards the beginning of my fitness journey quite a few years ago now. And as you can see there, despite my impeccable taste in holiday themed headwear, it's safe to say I was a pretty skinny guy. So next up, this photo, a little bit further along, a little bit more recent photo. It's about 10 years later to be exact. And you can see I've been able to make some pretty good progress in that time. It's important to point out though, a few thousand hours of training also went into that transformation. And that brings us to our final kind of disclaimer here. Resistance training is key. So nutrition, definitely the most important factor when it comes to building muscle and losing body fat. But I would say resistance training is actually the second most important factor for both of those. And for building muscle, that's probably not a huge surprise. I think most people are familiar with the idea. If you go to the gym and work out, you know, you're going to be building muscle, you get stronger and bigger muscles over time. But another factor that might be less obvious here, it actually is also important during fat loss because we want to preserve muscle tissue during that time. We want to feel good and look good. And so we don't want to be losing body fat and muscle when we're during fat loss. And if you use dietary strategies alone, sometimes that's what can happen. So resistance training is kind of the secret ingredient there, that missing piece of the puzzle that's going to help us really build muscle and lose body fat in an optimal way. And resistance training is a huge topic. So in the interest of being concise, I'm not going to talk about it today, but just know if you want to approach this optimally, that's something that you should include in your plan. And when we say resistance training, basically that means things, weight bearing exercise, whether you're lifting free weights with barbells and dumbbells, doing body weight exercise, maybe using some machines at the gym, things of that nature. So just a few kind of disclaimers there. Now that we've got all that stuff out of the way, we can go ahead and dive right into the nutrition stuff. And the first thing that I want to talk about is energy balance. What is energy balance? Well, the way we can think about it is it's kind of the balance, the ratio of the energy, the calories that we have coming in from our diet, food and drink versus the caloric expenditure that we have during the day, which is going to come from physical activity like exercise, but also from just your basal metabolic rate. The body uses up a certain amount of energy just by default, even if you're lying on the couch or sleeping, just to keep the lights on, so to speak. And our energy balance is going to be the main driver of muscle gain and also for fat loss, depending on which way we have that balance set up. Now, just to define our terms here, a calorie, of course, is a unit of energy, and that's commonly used to measure energy when we're talking about energy in food or calories that you're burning in the body. So when we talk about calories, we're just talking about energy. Now, one thing to keep in mind here, typically the easiest way to kind of have control over our energy balance is gonna be via the calories in side of the equation through our dietary intake. You can, of course, use activity and strategies like exercise to burn calories, but I find people tend to overestimate how many calories they're actually going to burn by exercising. An example of that I wanna to use today because we've got kind of a New York-based audience tuning in. So some of you guys might be familiar with Dunwell Donuts over there in Brooklyn. I've had their vegan donuts, they're amazing. If you go over there, pick up one of those donuts, you think, no big deal, I'm gonna burn that off with exercise. Well, you can certainly do that, but in order to burn that many calories, you're probably gonna to have to climb all the stairs in the Empire State Building. So there's no small feat to burn that number of calories. And for that reason, it's usually gonna be more practical and more effective for us to focus on calories inside of that energy balance to make sure we have it set up the way that we want. So going a little bit deeper here on energy balance, there's kind of three main states that we can be in with our energy balance, as you can see on the left here. 
First one is maintenance intake. And this is pretty straightforward. Basically, it means your caloric intake and expenditure are going to be about equal to one another. And this is where you tend to be by default. This is kind of where the body wants to be maintaining its weight. And this is a process called homeostasis. And so if your weight hasn't changed much recently, if you haven't gained or lost weight, then it's safe to say that you've probably been eating around your maintenance caloric intake. Next up, we've got a caloric deficit. And this is basically where your caloric intake actually is less than the calories that you're burning through activity. And that's when weight loss is going to occur because the body actually taps into its own tissue in order to make up the difference in energy between what it's getting in and what it's putting out. And this is also where most fat loss occurs and where fat loss occurs most optimally. And so this is gonna be very important for our purposes going forward. And then finally, of course, we've got a caloric surplus, and this is just the opposite of being in a deficit. So of course, your calories in are going to be greater than your calories out. And this is where weight gain can occur because the body is able to use those extra calories that it has coming in to synthesize new tissue, whether that's in the form of muscle or body fat. And so of course, this is where most muscle gain is going to occur as well. So a really common question I get from clients and just people who are interested in these topics is going to be, can I lose fat and gain muscle at the same time? Of course, this is great. If we can do that, that's like the best of both worlds. That's fantastic. That's what everybody wants to do. Unfortunately, I hate to be the bringer of bad news. It's usually not the optimal way to go for most people most of the time. And here's why. So for fat loss, we need to have a caloric deficit to progress with that optimally, as we just discussed. And for muscle gain, we want to be in a caloric surplus in order to progress optimally with that. And by definition, we cannot do both at the same time. A surplus and a deficit are the opposite of one another. And so you can only do one or the other at any given time, which means if you're trying to lose fat and gain muscle at the same time, you're not going to be doing both of those things optimally. And chances are you're not going to do either of them optimally because what typically happens if you're doing that, you're actually eating closer to your maintenance intake. It can be difficult to track your progress because your weight's not changing very much. And I've seen a lot of people do this and they feel like they're making progress, but really you're not. And you end up sort of spinning your wheels and you get discouraged and kind of lose motivation. So for those reasons, I find it's usually most effective to focus on either one goal, fat loss or the other, muscle gain at any given time. And of course you can shift gears at some point in the future and change from one to the other, but that's typically how I advise people to set up their nutrition. Now, some kind of notable exceptions here. There are a few cases where you can do a bit of both at the same time. One of those would be in complete beginners. So if you're totally new to resistance training and also kind of new to a scientific approach to dieting, then you can get some muscle gain and fat loss at the same time, just because that training stimulus is gonna be so novel to your body and the nutritional protocol that you're supplying is going to be a novel stimulus as well. Of course, the further along you go with your training and nutrition, the more difficult it's gonna to become to sustain that. And so typically down the road, you will still wanna pick one goal or the other to focus on. And then the last point here is just for very overweight individuals who are also new to resistance training, because they have a lot of body fat to lose, you can often get some fat loss and build a little bit of muscle at the same time there. Other than that though, good to pick one goal or the other. So logical question from that, of course, which one do we wanna pick? Well, it depends on your situation, but pretty straightforward here to think about it. If you're overweight, you've got some excess body fat that you wanna lose, well, it's a great idea to focus on fat loss first. On the other hand, if you're skinny and you don't have a lot of muscle or a lot of body fat, well, that's probably a good idea to focus on building muscle first. Now, if you're somewhere in between, you could go either way, but my recommendation, if you're not sure, would be maybe focus on building muscle first. And the reason for that is building muscle for most people is gonna be a little bit easier, a little bit more enjoyable as far as how you set up your nutrition. You have a higher calorie intake coming in and that makes the diet more flexible, more enjoyable, and it just kind of gives you a chance to get familiar with the principles of scientific dieting in a more forgiving environment. So that would be my recommendation there. Another recommendation to keep in mind though, whichever goal you choose, we're not going to just do that forever, right? So a good time frame to look at would be maybe choosing about 12 weeks. It doesn't have to be exactly that number, but I wouldn't recommend going much longer than that for fat loss without taking a break. So if we say we have a 12 week fat loss phase, see how you go and then take a couple of weeks off, go back to eating at your maintenance caloric intake 
so your weight's not changing too much during that time. And that'll just give you a little bit of a break, give your body a break from the caloric restriction that you've been exposing it to, and also give you a break just psychologically from that process of dieting. Allow your weight to kind of settle and stabilize, and then you can reassess, see where you want to go. If you still have more fat loss that you want to achieve, totally cool, you can do that. Or maybe you want to go ahead and shift gears, go ahead and focus on building some muscle. And if that's the case, having that maintenance phase is also going to give you a good starting point because you want to be starting from somewhere where your weight is stable and that way you can track your progress reliably. And of course, the opposite is also true. If you start with building muscle first, go for about 12 weeks, take a break for a couple of weeks, go back to eating and maintenance, and then you can reassess again. Where do you want to go from there? All right. So we want to go a little bit deeper on nutrition here. Talked a lot about calories. Obviously, calories are coming from food, but where exactly are we going to be getting them from in our food? Well, there's three main sources that we're going to focus on today, and those are our macronutrients, and those are carbohydrates, protein, and fat. As you can see here, carbohydrates and protein each provide roughly four calories per gram, whereas fat is nine calories per gram. So fat does have more than double the energy density of carbs and protein, and that doesn't mean fat is bad or that we shouldn't eat it. But it does mean when you think about how your diet is going to look, fat is probably going to make up a little bit smaller proportion of it compared to your carbohydrates and protein. Now, when you're eating a whole food plant-based diet, you're also going to be getting a lot of dietary fiber in, which is fantastic. It has a lot of, belt, uh, a lot of health benefits and it's great for cultivating a healthy gut microbiome, feeding your good gut bacteria. However, it doesn't provide a significant amount of calories that our bodies can actually digest and absorb. And so for that reason, it's not going to be a main source of energy in our diet. Now, as you can see here, alcohol also does provide calories to the tune of seven calories per gram. Unfortunately, I hate to be the bringer of bad news, but I'm not gonna recommend it as a source of energy for either building muscle or losing fat. And the reason for that is alcohol calories are effectively empty calories. You're not gonna be getting a lot of nutrients with it. And so for any calories that you're having from alcohol, there's an opportunity cost because they would be displacing calories that you could be getting from healthier, kind of more nutrient dense, vibrant, nourishing foods like the ones that you see on the left here. The other thing with alcohol though, and this is probably less well known and understood, but more important, especially if you have the goal of fat loss, is that alcohol is used preferentially as a fuel source in the body. And so what that means basically is, let's say you're going along, you've got your goal of fat loss, you're eating in a caloric deficit, so you're losing body fat, just like we talked about. If you have alcohol then coming into your system, the body basically wants to get rid of it as soon as possible. And so it is going to put that fat loss on hold, burn off the alcohol first, and only once it's gone, can you go back to burning body fat as fuel. And so it can kind of throw a wrench in the works that way when it comes to fat loss. That being said, it's not that you can never have alcohol, but definitely for our purposes, keep it in moderation would be my recommendation there. I will hop down off my soapbox now, rant over about alcohol. You have it if you want, but just don't go overboard. Just to summarize some of the stuff we've talked about so far, our daily energy intake is going to be coming from calories, and that is going to be measured in calories, excuse me. Calories come from macronutrients, and we're going to find those in the foods that we eat. Well, what foods are we going to find them in? So for carbohydrates, we've got a great abundance of sources on a whole food plant-based diet, and that's fantastic because carbohydrates are the body's preferred source of fuel, and they're going to give us some really good, clean, burning energy for your workouts or daily activity, anything that you want to do. So sources of carbohydrates on a whole food plant-based diet are going to include things like whole grains, legumes, starchy vegetables, so things like potatoes and sweet potatoes, and then fruit, of course, contains carbohydrate and other vegetables do as well. Next up, we've got our whole food plant-based protein sources. And of course, the superstars here are gonna be the legumes of all forms. So those are things like you know, beans and split peas, chickpeas, lentils. All of these foods are super nutrient dense, high in fiber, high in protein. So they're all great sources there. We can also get a lot of protein from our traditional soy products. And those are things like tofu, tempeh, whole soy milk, basically traditional means soy products that are minimally processed. So things like that rather than you know your soy protein isolate or concentrate which would be highly processed foods we can also get a lot of protein from nuts and seeds whole grains even provide a decent amount and greens and other vegetables have a relatively high amount of protein compared to their total calorie content 
but it's just that these are lower calorie foods and so they're not going to contribute a significant amount of our total daily protein intake. And then of course we've got our whole food plant-based fat sources here. So the main ones here are gonna be coming from nuts and seeds. Of course, there are also some high fat fruits like avocados and olives that can be a source of healthy fat in the diet. And then we also have our traditional soy products. Again, you're going to be providing some healthy fats there as well. All right, so we've got our macronutrients here. How do we want to allocate our caloric intake to these? Well, for the purposes of building muscle and losing body fat, it usually is a good idea to kind of prioritize protein first. Because if you think about it, protein is kind of a building block type of nutrient. It's used in muscle tissue and it has a lot of other functions in the body. And so of course, having enough protein in your diet is gonna be important when it comes to building muscle. But maybe less commonly understood, it's also very important to have a sufficient protein intake during fat loss. And the reason for that is when you are in a caloric deficit for fat loss, the body's breaking down its own tissue. You don't want it to break down muscle tissue. As we've discussed, we wanna break down fat for that energy. And so having sufficient dietary protein coming in is going to have kind of a muscle sparing effect where your body can then use the protein that you're eating rather than the protein that you've got in your muscles there as fuel. Uh, it's important to keep in mind optimal protein intake for building muscle and maintaining it during fat loss is going to be a bit higher than just the minimum protein requirement that you would want to maintain general health and well-being. And how high is it? Well, there's a pretty good base of evidence now to suggest somewhere between 0.7 and 1 grams of protein per pound of healthy body weight is going to be a good range to start in for the goals of muscle gain and fat loss. Now, you certainly don't have to eat more than 1 gram per pound of body weight. If you're less than 0.7 grams, though, you may be leaving some cards on the table for building muscle. You can absolutely still do it with a lower protein intake than that, but it's just going to be maybe not quite as optimal in that department. I'm sorry, Forrest, to interrupt. Um, we have someone asking to slow down, so I think they're taking notes. If okay, you yeah, no on. worries. It's fine, thank you. I'll, I'll try and slow it down a little bit here. Of course, the it's video will be up on YouTube <laughs> after the fact as well. Thank you. Cool, and just a word about protein before we move forward. Supplements such as plant-based protein powder, protein bars, things like that, can be used sometimes to hit your protein target. They are definitely not required, but they are a sort of a convenience item, right? So if you feel like you're having a hard time getting to that protein goal at the end of the day, especially if you're on lower calories for fat loss, then it can be beneficial sometimes to include these. But it's important to keep in mind, they are not a whole food. They're not even really food. They're more of a supplement. And so they're not going to make up a significant part of our overall dietary strategy. All right, so moving forward here. And if anyone does want to take notes or if anyone would like a copy of these slides, I'm also happy to send those over via email or anything like that after the fact. So don't feel like you have to write down everything that's on the slides. I'm happy to send those to you. Thank you. A lot of people will appreciate that. No worries. All right, so moving along with our macronutrients here. Next up, we've got our dietary fat. And of course, as we discussed, fat is going to be a concentrated source of energy. But again, that doesn't make it bad. It is essential to have sufficient dietary fat for good health, but a few things to keep in mind with it. Dietary fat is easier for the body to store as body fat, which kind of makes sense when you think about it because the molecules are already coming into your body in the form of fat. Uh, the body can store that away more easily than it can with carbs and protein, which you would have to first convert into fat. And for that reason, it's a good idea to limit our fat intake a bit when we have the goal of fat loss, obviously, because you don't want to be storing a ton of fat when your goal is to burn fat, but also a good idea to limit it when the goal is muscle gain. And that's because if you're in a caloric surplus and trying to build muscle, you've got extra calories coming in, but you want those to go towards building muscle. You don't want to just be eating a ton of fat and then the body's just storing it as fat, because obviously we won't end up with that body composition of more muscle and less body fat that we're going for. So with that in mind, I would typically recommend allocate maybe 10 to 20% of your daily calories to come from fat. And that's gonna be a good starting point, keeping in mind that that's a low fat intake compared to the standard American diet, but it's actually not really a low fat intake if you're on a whole food plant-based diet. You're probably gonna be coming in somewhere around that range anyway, so you don't have to worry about it too much, but just don't go crazy overboard with the fats would be my recommendation there. And then finally, we've got our carbohydrates here. Again, very abundant on a whole food plant-based diet. Carbohydrates are easily accessible source of energy to the body. And so that's what the body is going to use to fuel your workouts, your training, your recovery, all of that good stuff. And carbohydrates typically will provide the majority of the daily calorie intake in our diet. 
but that is going to be variable depending on your goal. So if you've got the goal of building muscle, you wanna be in a caloric surplus, then we can eat a little bit higher carbohydrate to get those extra calories in. And if you wanna be in a caloric deficit with the goal of fat loss, your carbohydrate intake is probably going to be a little bit lower in order to get into that deficit. Either way though, probably at least 50% of your daily calories will be coming from carbs. And if you're on higher calories for building muscle, up to 60% and above is totally fine. Just depends on where you're at there. All right, so I wanna get into some tracking stuff here. Um, sticking with diet for just a moment longer though, we've covered some good kind of foundational concepts as far as calories and macronutrients. How are we gonna use this information to really set up our diet for success with building muscle and losing body fat? Well, there's two main approaches that we can use. One would be to focus more on the energy density of the foods that we're eating, and the other one is to track our macronutrient intake. And I'm gonna talk more about both of those in just a moment. A couple of things to keep in mind though, before we get into that. With either approach, it's gonna be a good idea to start with your current dietary intake and then make adjustments from there. And two reasons why that's a good idea. One, for most of us, it's likely that you have been maintaining your weight recently because that's what the body tries to do. And so if your weight hasn't changed much over the past few months, it's a good guess that you are eating close to your maintenance caloric intake. And so that's a good place to start from if you know that's kind of your baseline. And then in order to build muscle, of course, we wanna increase calories a little bit above that. In order to lose body fat, we wanna decrease them a little below. Uh, another reason why it's a good idea to start with your current dietary intake is you want to make this sustainable. And sometimes I see people come in, especially when they're kind of new to fitness and nutrition and want to start a new regime or a new program there. And they'll try to overhaul everything overnight. And it just makes it really hard to stick with it. If you change too many things all at once, you kind of feel a little bit lost. And you don't quite know how to set up your diet. And so what I would recommend instead is start from where you are and then track your progress make gradual adjustments over time, and you can kind of fine tune it, get it dialed in so you're moving in the right direction, but it doesn't have to happen all at once. Better to do things gradually because that makes it more sustainable. And then our second point here, we do wanna prioritize protein at each meal. And then pro because protein is important, obviously for building muscle and for fat loss, wanna make sure we're getting plenty in and then distributing it also relatively evenly throughout the day. So kind of think, you know, if you have three or four protein feedings throughout the day, rather than, you know, two meals with low protein, then a ton of protein all at once, the body's gonna handle it better if you kind of drip feed that protein consistently throughout the day. It doesn't have to be exactly the same amount at each meal, of course, but you wanna have something of a balance there. All right, so getting into kind of our two dietary strategies that we can use here to lose body fat and build muscle. The first one is to focus on energy density. And what is energy density? Well, we kind of touched on it a little bit already, but basically the way we can think of it is, it's the amount of calories in a particular weight of food. So the more calories something has you know, per weight, the more energy dense it's gonna be, and the less calories that are in a particular food at that same weight, then sort of the lower energy density that it will have. An important note here is, Whole plant foods do tend to have lower energy density than processed foods and animal products, but they actually have higher nutrient density of micronutrients, so things like your vitamins, minerals, antioxidants, and phytonutrients. And that's great from a health perspective because it means you're gonna be getting a really good bang for your buck from the calories that you're eating. You're gonna be getting the maximum amount of nutrients out of them, which is fantastic. But it's just something to keep in mind when you are eating a whole food plant-based diet, the total volume of food that you're eating might actually be a little bit higher for the same amount of calories than if you were eating kind of more of a standard American diet or an omnivorous diet. And this is good actually for fat loss because it means you get to eat more, you're not gonna feel as hungry, you're not gonna feel kind of deprived on your diet and you can still be in a caloric deficit. And a good way to ensure this happens is to incorporate more low energy density foods when you have the goal of fat loss. Low energy density foods are of course gonna be things like you know, your green leafy vegetables and your other water rich fruits and vegetables. So things like apples and oranges or you know, celery and cucumbers and tomatoes and things like that. They have a lot of water and a lot of fiber in them. And so they're gonna add volume and bulk to your meals without contributing a lot of calories. And so you can easily stay in a caloric deficit while feeling full and satiated. Now for muscle gain, we wanna kind of do the opposite, of course. We wanna get up into a caloric surplus. And so in order to do that, it's beneficial to eat more higher energy density foods. And these are gonna allow us to get more calories in for the volume that we're eating. So these are things like whole grains, 
nuts and seeds, dried fruit, et cetera, they're gonna pack a good kind of caloric bang for your buck into that smaller package. Now with either of these approaches, you don't wanna just eat exclusively these foods, still eat a varied and balanced whole food diet, but you can kind of shift the focus a little bit more towards lower or higher energy density foods, depending on which goal you have. So that's the approach I would recommend for those of you who don't wanna count calories, because this is probably the easier, more intuitive approach for a lot of people and maybe a little bit more kind of flexibility and enjoyment with your diet that way. If you do wanna track your calorie and macronutrient intake though, buckle up, because that's what we're gonna talk about right now. This is a very advanced strategy. It's not required to build muscle and burn fat, and it does require more time and effort. But with that being said, this is kind of the highest level thing that you can do if you really want to know what's going on with your diet. You have the most precision, the most control. You can see exactly how many calories you're eating, how many grams of carbohydrates, fats, and protein. And that gives you some really good insight into what's going on and also allows us to make really specific and kind of calculated adjustments to your nutrition in order to make sure you're moving in the right direction. So this is the strategy that I use with a lot of my clients who are doing physique or bodybuilding compositions. It's what I personally do myself. And it's what high level athletes typically do too, just to make sure that their nutrition is kind of optimally set up. So if you're interested in getting started with kind of calorie and macronutrient tracking, it can seem a little bit daunting at first, but the good news is nowadays we have some really great tools that are gonna make it a lot easier. So we've got a number of free apps out there that you can use to keep track of your diet. Probably two of the most popular ones are gonna be MyFitnessPal and Chronometer. And so these are two that I would recommend looking at if you wanna get started. MyFitnessPal is probably good for beginners because it's a little bit kind of simpler and easier to use. It's very easy and intuitive to pick up and just kind of get the hang of it. And so that would, I would say is a good starting point if you are new to this process. And then if you wanna go next level, kind of get a little bit more in depth, Chronometer is a great resource to use because it gives you more complex more detailed information as far as things like your micronutrient intake, different vitamins and minerals and amino acids and things like that. So that's a great tool to have, but it is a little bit, again, more advanced. And so if you're new to this process, MyFitnessPal is a great one to start with. All right, so moving on with tracking here, we wanna talk next about tracking body weight. And why is this a good idea? Why do you wanna track your weight? Well, as we had established earlier, if you're going to be focusing on fat loss, you want to be in a caloric deficit. If you're going to focus on building muscle, you want to be in a caloric surplus. And both of those conditions mean that your weight is going to be changing. It's going to be going down if you're in a deficit, up if you're in a surplus. And so by tracking your body weight, you can get a really good sense if that's actually happening or not, and if you're making progress. Now, I know some people don't like to track weight and maybe not do it on a regular basis. And if that's you, that's totally cool. You don't have to do it. Again, this is not required to make progress. But just like with tracking your macronutrient intake, it can provide some really valuable data that we can use. If you don't wanna do it though, alternative methods that you can use to track your progress are things like circumference measurements with the tape measure. Uh, you can pay attention to just how well your clothes are fitting. Some people like to take progress photos, which can be a cool way to track your progress visually. And then of course, how you look and feel at the end of the day, that's the most important factor because that's what we really want to achieve here is looking better and feeling better as we stated at the beginning. So if you look great and you feel great, it doesn't really matter what the scale says. But with that being said, the scale is a valuable tool and a resource that we can use to make sure that we are moving in the direction that we wanna go. So if you do wanna track your body weight, here's the best way to do it. Weigh in at the same time of day, each time you weigh yourself. And first thing in the morning is typically the best time to do that. And the reason for this is, it's very normal for our body weight to fluctuate by several pounds throughout the course of the day, just because you're gonna be eating and drinking and doing various activities. And so we want to make sure we're comparing apples to apples with these measurements. So first thing in the morning, after you get up, go to the bathroom, before you get dressed and have breakfast, that's gonna typically be your most consistent weight throughout the day. It's usually also the lightest weight of the day. And that's what we wanna record just to keep things as consistent and accurate as possible. Now the next point here though, it's also normal for your weight to fluctuate by a couple pounds just from one day to the next. That's just something that naturally happens in the body depending on kind of your hydration status and hormone balance and lots of different factors there. The weight's going to go up and down a bit. And this can make it kind of confusing and challenging to track your weight and really identify if you're moving in the right direction. And so the way we address this is by recording your weight multiple times per week. So if you can do at least three times a week, that's great. Up to daily weigh-ins if you wanna get that kind of granular with it. You don't have to do that, of course. 
but if you do at least three weigh-ins per week, then we're gonna average those together, calculate the week's average weight, and then once you've done that for a couple weeks, calculate your average weight for each week, and then we're gonna compare average to average from one week to the next, and that is gonna make it really easy to establish a trend, because you can see if your weekly average weights are going up, very likely you're in a caloric surplus, which is good for building muscle. If your weekly average weights are going down, it's very likely that you're gonna be in a caloric deficit, which is great for fat loss. And if they're staying the same, well, you're probably eating around maintenance. So that's how I would recommend doing it if you do want to track your body weight. And kind of following logically along from that, we wanna look at sort of the expected rates of change in body weight that we might see here for each of our goals. Important to note is Fat loss is usually going to occur significantly faster than building muscle will, and that's just kind of a physiological reality. That's how the body works. You can burn fat a lot faster than you can actually synthesize new muscle tissue. So kind of a reasonable starting point here for weight loss would be up to 1% of your total body weight per week. And that's a pretty significant weight loss there. So if you weigh 150 pounds, that would be one and a half pounds of weight loss. You don't have to go that fast by any means though. So I would say even you know, 0.5% of your total body weight per week for fat loss is a totally great, healthy, sustainable rate of weight loss. And then for building muscle, we can see it's actually gonna be much slower here. Probably 1% of your body weight in the course of a month is gonna be a more realistic target to achieve there. And so what that means, of course, we wanna be in a greater caloric deficit for fat loss and just a little bit smaller of a caloric surplus for building muscle out the way. Now, when we talk about how our calorie intake is gonna affect our body weight, a uh, good rule of thumb here, this isn't 100% perfectly accurate, but it'll give you a good idea, is if you have your maintenance intake, so you're eating a certain amount of calories to maintain your weight, and you go 500 calories above that and eat that much for an entire week, you're probably going to see about one pound of weight gain. And then on the flip side, if you were to go about 500 calories per day below your maintenance intake, and eat that way for a week, you're gonna see about one pound per week of weight loss. Now this won't continue indefinitely because your body adapts to whatever calorie intake you give it, but for the first week or two anyway, that'll give you a pretty good idea of kind of the progress that you could expect. And of course, as we were talking about, 500 calories a day might be a good deficit to be in for fat loss because that might give you a pound a week of weight loss. Probably we wanna be in a smaller surplus than that for building muscle because we don't really want to gain a pound per week unless you, know, you weigh 400 pounds, then maybe that's gonna give you 1% of body weight per month. I'm guessing most of the people tuning in, that's gonna be a little bit faster a rate of weight gain than we want. So what does 500 calories look like? Give you an idea, it looks something like this. So that's just one example. Super quick and easy, you have a couple of slices of whole grain bed, throw on some natural peanut butter there, banana, you're good to go. That's just one example. Of course, there's a lot of different ways you could get 500 calories, but that's just to give you kind of a rough idea of what that amount of food might be. All right, so the next question that I get all the time from clients, of course, is can I go faster? People want immediate results. They want to lose fat right away. They want to get jacked, build muscle as soon as possible. And again, I'm sorry to be the bringer of bad news. You can go faster, but I do not recommend it for most people most of the time, and here's why. For faster fat loss, you have to be in a greater caloric deficit. So that difference between the calories that you have coming in from your diet and the calories you have going out through activity and exercise is going to be much bigger. And what that means is the body has to tap into and break down even more of its own tissue to make up that difference. And of course, a lot of that's gonna come from body fat, but the bigger that deficit is, the faster we're going, the greater the risk is the body's also gonna start down breaking down its own muscle tissue as a source of energy. And that's not what we want, of course. We want to be preserving muscle mass. And so for that reason, a slower approach is going to be more advantageous. Of course, if you're in a steeper caloric deficit, you've just got less total food coming in. And that means you're more likely to feel hungry. You're going to have less energy for your training and daily life. And that makes the whole process less enjoyable and sustainable. And so you can't really stick with it long term usually. And those in conjunction with this last point here, this is the kicker, is metabolic adaptation. And what that means is basically just what I mentioned a moment ago. Whatever caloric intake you give your body, it's going to try to adapt to that over time, especially if it's in a caloric deficit. Your body will slow down your metabolic processes, try to conserve energy, burn fewer calories. And that's good from a survival standpoint. It's going to keep you from starving to death. But it's bad when you go on a crash diet, you're eating super low calories, your metabolic rate comes way down, 
And then of course you can't sustain the diet because you feel hungry all the time. You go back to eating more. Now your energy intake's up here, your metabolism's down here. You've got a surplus and you're gonna end up with rapid weight regain, fat regain. And that's kind of the vicious cycle that people end up in with yo-yo dieting. And so for that reason, much better idea, take it slow and steady, make it sustainable and you'll get better results long-term, I guarantee you. Now for weight gain, it's a little bit more straightforward. Basically you can gain weight faster than the rate at which I recommended, but it just means a greater proportion of the weight that you gain is probably gonna be coming from body fat because there's a limited rate at which the body can actually build and synthesize new muscle tissue. And so if you're going much faster than that, that extra weight is just gonna be coming in the form of fat. And that's not the end of the world, but assuming you wanna end up with a lean physique when all is said and done, you're just creating more work for yourself in the future, trying to strip that fat off. So something to keep in mind there. All right, getting into kind of some fun stuff here. I'm gonna have a drink from my nutritionfacts.org mug. I saw somebody notice that. And on the subject of nutritionfacts.org, I wanna give a huge shout out to Dr. Michael Greger. I'm sure a lot of you are probably already familiar with his work, but if you are interested in evidence-based nutrition for fat loss and you wanna go really deep on the subject, I can highly, highly recommend checking out this new book, How Not to Diet, which just came out last year. And that's a fantastic resource on the subject, not to be confused with How Not to Die, which was this other book that came out a few years previously, also a fantastic book just about general health. Um, but how not to diet in particular for fat loss is fantastic. And some of these tips here that I'm about to go over are actually taken directly from his recommendations in that book. And so I have to give credit where credit is due. Hats off to you, Dr. Greger. All right, so we're gonna get into some calorie dilution stuff. Basically what calorie dilution means is it's kind of sneaky ways that we can trick the body into eating lower calories without feeling deprived, feeling like you're hungry all the time. And again, making your diet more sustainable in that process. A good way to do that is by eating more high fiber foods and some reasons why that's a good idea. Well, fiber is thermogenic, meaning it requires a lot of energy to break down and digest and absorb. And so that means the calories that you're eating from food, you're actually gonna then be burning calories to digest them. Kind of a win there. It also adds bulk and volume to your diet. So you're gonna feel more full and satiated. And that's important when you are in a calorie deficit because you might be eating a little bit less food than you would otherwise. Now, an important uh, kind of point with fiber here, as we talked about earlier, it's not really digested and absorbed that much by the body itself, but it does make great food and fuel for your gut microbiome, your good gut bacteria. However, it takes time for your microbiome to adjust. So if you haven't been eating a high fiber intake recently, it's a good idea to bump that up slowly because that way you give your body a chance to adapt to it. If you go from eating not a lot of fiber to suddenly eating a ton, you might have symptoms of bloating, kind of feeling gassy and digestive stress and that sort of thing. And so that doesn't mean you want to throw out your high fiber foods and you know, keeping the beans and the whole grains and all that good stuff in there, but just increasing the amount that you can eat gradually, that you eat gradually and that over the course of a few weeks, you find you get used to it and you'll feel a lot better. Next point here, which kind of follows along on the first one, is actually focusing on intact whole foods. And this is kind of a nuanced point, but basically what it comes down to is this. When you're eating whole plant foods, all plants are gonna have cell walls. That's kind of how they keep their structure. So animals have bones that hold them up, plants don't. And so they have cell walls, which are rigid, to give them their shape and structure. And those cell walls in your body when you're eating the food, they're actually going to track trap some of the calories and the macronutrients in there. And so you won't fully digest and absorb all of them. And of course, when you're chewing the food, you're gonna break down some of those cell walls and kind of break it up during digestion and that sort of thing. But some of them will make it through and that actually ends up then feeding your good gut bacteria, which is really beneficial for your health. And it means you're actually getting a lower number of calories for the same amount of food that you're eating. Versus if we were to take a blender and you know blitz everything up in a smoothie or grind nuts into nut butter or make whole grains into flour, yeah, they're still whole foods, but those cell walls are all obliterated now. And so you're going to digest and absorb all the calories, which means, you know, harder to be in a caloric deficit. And it's also giving less food for your good gut bacteria. So for that reason, it's a good idea to try to get in as many intact whole foods as possible when you have the goal of fat loss. Another one here, it's always a good idea to stay hydrated, drinking plenty of water, but cold water in particular can actually help boost your metabolic rate, speed up fat loss. And then also drinking water before meals can just help fill you up and kind of displace some of the volume of food that you might otherwise eat. 
And so that's going to help then if you're eating a slightly smaller portion size of that meal. Recommendation here is nine cups a day for women, 13 for men. Uh, but that's just kind of a minimum. Obviously, if it's summertime, you're exercising, you're sweating, et cetera, you can drink more than that, but that would be just kind of the baseline amount you want to get in. All right, next up, we've got some more metabolism boosting tips. And I find these ones in particular are really cool. There's actually certain herbs and spices that have been shown to kind of accelerate fat loss, speed up your metabolic rate. And as a bonus, they make your food taste great. So all of these ones right here have that property. It's interesting to note cumin and black cumin are actually two different spices there. Black cumin's a little bit more rare, but you can probably find both of them at an you know, Asian supermarket or something like that. Um, then we've got garlic powder, ground ginger, or cayenne pepper, so you can do one or the other to get that benefit. And then nutritional yeast as well. And the amount next to each one is basically a daily recommendation to try and get in, which will give you that fat burning benefit. And as a bonus, make your food taste great as well. Another one here is to incorporate vinegar into your meals. You can actually have two teaspoons of vinegar up to three times a day, breakfast, lunch, and dinner to help speed up fat loss. Uh, it might be a little bit tough to get that vinegar in for breakfast, but you can probably do it lunch and dinner, no problem. It's important to note though, we wanna use that as a flavoring in meals or a salad dressing. Do not drink straight vinegar, it's very acidic. It might burn your esophagus, so work it into the other stuff that you're eating. And then finally, we've got green tea here as well. Three cups a day has been shown to help with fat loss. However, you don't want to have it with your main meals because it can interfere with your iron absorption a little bit. So a good idea to have those between meals. And then of course, because green tea has a little bit of caffeine in it, you don't want to have it close to bedtime. So try to have that earlier in the day. Now, some timing tips here for fat loss. Big one, first of all, is mindful eating, especially nowadays we're all connected you know, with our devices and online and multitasking and things of that nature. And you want to avoid doing that while you're eating, just because if you're distracted doing something else while you're eating, you're more likely to just keep eating more than you need to eat beyond the point where you feel full and satiated, et cetera. And so it's a good idea to just slow down your eating rate, make sure you're chewing your food thoroughly. You'll definitely enjoy your meals more that way. And it'll also extend your meal duration. And if you can take at least 20 minutes from when you start to when you finish a meal, that's about how long it takes for the body to actually register that you've eaten and kind of start feeling satiated. And so that way you'll make sure that you don't exceed the amount of food that you actually need versus if you just wolf everything down to five minutes, you can easily eat more calories than you needed to and your body's not going to have realized yet that you've eaten. Next up, a pretty cool one here, front loading your calories. So what this means is basically calories that we have earlier in the beginning of the day actually count less towards our total energy balance than those eaten at night. And that sounds weird, but it kind of makes sense if you think about it because you're probably gonna be more active during the day. You might be working or working out or doing whatever you're doing, grocery shopping burns calories. Um, and so those calories that you're eating earlier in the day are gonna be getting burned off more versus if you eat a lot of calories close to bedtime, there's gonna be less demand for them and it's more likely they'll be stored as fat. And then following along with that one here, time-restricted eating is another strategy that we can use for fat loss. And this is super popular nowadays. I'm sure a lot of people have heard about like intermittent fasting and stuff like that, which are forms of time-restricted eating. And it has been shown that limiting your daily eating window a bit can help with fat loss, probably just because if you're eating during a smaller window of time, you're gonna eat fewer calories just naturally overall. Uh, and it's a good idea to have this eating window end a few hours before you go to bed, again, so that you're not eating a ton of calories and then going straight to bed and the calories aren't gonna be burned off. All right, so we've got a lot of tips there. Again, important to keep in mind, you don't have to do all of those things in order to lose fat. If you follow the other principles that we've been talking about so far, you should be on the right track already, but those are just extra little bonus things that you can throw in there to help really get things optimized and moving in the right direction. And how can we tie all of that together into a day's worth of eating that's going to be really healthy, delicious, and conducive to our goals of fat loss? Well, we're going to have a look at that right now. So this one, breakfast, pretty straightforward. This is basically what I eat for breakfast every single day. Breakfast of champions, we've got our whole grain oats in there. We've got some natural soy milk, so no added sugar or oil. And then we've got some berries in there, so that's going to be giving us lots of nutrient density with the berries. Not a ton of extra calories. Plenty of protein from the soy milk and carbs from the oats there. So that's a great way to start the day if you have the goal of fat loss. For a snack, we could have any type of those kind of water and fiber rich fruits and vegetables. So this one, for example, we've got some baked kale chips there, which is kind of a little bit more of a fun one. But of course, you could just be munching on, you know, some carrot sticks or celery or cucumber, or apples and oranges, whatever kind of fruits and veggies you enjoy. They're great for helping fill you up, get lots of nutrients in without adding a ton of extra calories. Now for lunch, we might have something like this. 
really healthy vegetable stir fry with lots of greens in there. Throw some tofu in for added protein. And this is gonna be a really kind of high volume meal, help fill you up, keep you satisfied without a lot of extra calories needed. Now, depending on your calorie intake, you could also throw some whole grain rice in there, which would be fantastic. Get some extra carbs that way. But this is a really satiating meal, even just with the tofu and vegetables there. You get lots of protein, lots of fiber, and lots of volume. And it's important to note when I say stir fry, we don't want to fry this in oil. We're going to keep it whole food plant based. You can easily do it in vegetable stock, water, that sort of thing, no problem. Now, for our post workout snack here, assuming you are doing resistance training in the afternoon, you could do it you know, in the morning, then you have the post workout snack at that time post-workout, we want to get some fast-acting protein and carbohydrates in because that is when your body is going to be most primed to take advantage of those nutrients. And so this is one time out of the day where you might have a protein shake just for convenience, get some, you know, kind of quick and easy protein on the go after you finish your workout. And then our carbohydrates, we can have some fruit there. But again, we're having it in the intact whole fruit form. We're keeping those cell walls intact. We're not blending that up into a smoothie. And then finally for dinner here, we've got a beautiful, big, thick, hearty vegetable soup here. We've got lots of greens in there. We've got some lentils or beans, gonna be giving you a lot of protein. Throw any other vegetables that you want in there. And soup in particular has actually been shown to be more satiating than other foods, even that have similar volume and similar calorie content. People, for whatever reason, report feeling more full after they eat soup. And so that's just something that's good to know. You have the goal of fat loss, you can smash some soup in there and you're gonna feel really full and satisfied get lots of protein in without going over on your calories. So that's a sample day of eating there uh, for fat loss. Next up, we're gonna talk about building muscle and we're gonna kind of flip the script a little bit. We're gonna do the opposite of some of those things we were just talking about for fat loss because we wanna get out of a calorie deficit into a surplus. That's where muscle gain is going to occur. So this time we wanna focus on calorie density rather than calorie dilution. And what that means, it's actually okay to blend some of your foods. We still want to be eating whole plant foods, but blending is going to make it easier to eat more calories. It makes it easier to consume, digest, and absorb those nutrients because you're effectively doing some of the work for you. You're using the blender to blitz up some of those foods and just make it easier. It's always easier to drink calories than it is to eat them. And so big smoothies can be great. If you are trying to gain weight on a whole food plant-based diet, again, it's a high volume diet. You're going to be eating a lot of food. And so using some of these strategies can be helpful just to make it easier to get those calories in. And also examples of blended foods and kind of more calorie dense ones we could use. Natural nut and seed butters are totally fine. Make sure you're getting ones without added sugar and oil, but if it's just, you know, like blended up peanuts or, you know, like tahini from sesame seeds, things like that are cool. And then 100% whole grain flour products as well, like bread and pasta are fine. They're going to give you a little bit more kind of calorie density. Again, having blended up those foods is going to make it easier to absorb the calories and nutrients. But we don't want to eat exclusively blended foods. You still want to have plenty of whole intact foods in there too. So we are feeding our good gut bacteria and they don't go hungry. Now, of course, we still want to stay hydrated. Always a good idea to do that, especially when you're training. But maybe shifting your water intake away from meals, just because, again, you're going to be eating bigger, higher volume meals. You might feel pretty full at that time. And if you try to drink a bunch of water at the same time, you might get uncomfortable. So just having that water in between meals throughout the day can be a good tip there. And then finally, we've got our timing tips for muscle gain here. We do not want to do time-restricted eating if you're trying to build muscle, especially on a whole food plant-based diet, because as we stated earlier, you're going to be eating a larger volume of food and trying to then cram that down into a narrow window of time throughout the day, just not going to be very practical for most people. It's also a good idea to have a steady supply of calories and nutrients coming in to really fuel your body when you're trying to build muscle. So you definitely want to be eating anytime you're hungry rather than sort of imposing some form of restriction on what you eat throughout the day. With that being said though, still a good idea to front load your calories. And in this case, it's not so much because we don't want the calories to count as much from earlier in the day, but it's because it will make it easier to get all your calories in throughout the day. So you don't find yourself in that situation where it's 10 PM and you still have a thousand calories left to eat for the day. I've been there many times myself, it's not a lot of fun. So if you front load your calories, that will just kind of set you up for success, get a proactive start on getting everything in for the day. And then of course, you'll also avoid eating a lot late at night, which would probably result in excess fat gain there. All right, so last up, we've got our example muscle building meal plan. And these are gonna be some meals that we can set up again, getting more of that energy density in, help get into that calorie surplus where we're gonna build muscle. Breakfast, we've still got our same breakfast of champions here. Oats with soy milk, getting carbs and proteins there as the base. 
But then as a topping, we're gonna to swap out the berries, throw in some dried fruit, throw in some nuts, get a lot more calorie density into a similar sized meal there. Then for a snack, this is a pretty straightforward one as we talked about earlier, easy way to get you know, an extra four or 500 calories in, a couple of slices of whole grain bread, throw some natural peanut butter on there, takes zero time to prepare and you're good to go. For lunch, this is a really good kind of higher energy density meal, kind of a Mexican style burrito bowl. We've got rice and beans and corn for some great protein and carbohydrates. And then also throwing some avocado in there so you're gonna be getting some healthy fats, a little bit higher calorie density there. Now, post-workout, again, we do wanna have our simple carbohydrates and proteins coming in to help with recovery, but this time it's fine to throw everything in the Vitamix there. I'm sure if you guys are whole food plant-based card carriers, you've already got your Vitamix set up, so that'll be easy to do. And then just blitz everything up, super quick and easy and convenient. You can have that on your way home from the gym or that sort of thing. You'll be getting your post-workout protein and carbs in a blended form to maximize digestion and absorption. And then finally for dinner here, this is one of my favorite, really delicious, high protein, high fiber meals. I actually had this for lunch yesterday. And this is wholemeal pasta with a lentil bolognese sauce. So you're gonna be getting tons of protein in that way. Tons of fiber, really hearty, satiating meal there. Now you could have a salad or something like that on the side to get extra greens in, which would be super healthy. But when you're eating a big portion like that, sometimes that's tough to do and just in terms of the total volume of food. So one trick that I like to do, you can take your spinach, your kale, your greens, and actually throw that into the sauce when you're preparing it. And that's going to give you that extra nutrient density without adding a lot of volume to the meal. All right, so those are our two sample meal plans there. Again, there's an unlimited variety of foods that you can eat to achieve these goals. That's just to kind of give you a quick snapshot of what it could look like. Just about done here. One final tip that I want to share with you guys. Consistency is key. If you want to be successful in losing fat or building muscle long term, you have to be consistent with your nutrition and with your training. And so what that means is look for ways to set this up sustainably for yourself. Make it a process that you enjoy. Make it something that you can see yourself doing weeks and months and years down the road because that's how long it takes to really get lasting results in these areas, especially with building muscle. It's a very slow process. So if you're forcing yourself to do something and you hate it, eh, you're probably not gonna stick with it long term. Go gradually, be gentle with yourself, look for ways you can incorporate some of these tips here and there. And if you can keep doing that, adding up those small changes, layer them on top of each other over time, I guarantee you after you know, a week and a month and a year goes by, you're gonna be in a much better place than where you started. Just give it the time, be patient be consistent. All right, just to summarize here, some of the key points that we've gone over today, nutrition is gonna be the most important factor whether you wanna build muscle or lose body fat. We wanna be in a surplus of calories for building muscle and a deficit for fat loss. And we can use the energy density of the foods that we're eating to get into either of those two states. You don't have to track your calorie and macronutrient intake or your body weight. You can make progress without it, but they both do provide valuable insight. And then finally, to summarize our fat loss tips here, including more high fiber and high water, lower energy density foods there for fat loss, more intact whole foods rather than blended, include some of those herbs and spices that we talked about to help boost your metabolism, and then staying hydrated, slow down and practice your mindful eating, get those calories in early and stop eating a few hours before bed. And then for muscle gain, more of those energy dense blended whole foods are fine, still staying hydrated, maybe not with your main meals, and still front loading calories, but without limiting that daily eating window. All right, so I know that was a lot of information to take in. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. I hope you found this beneficial. Um, and yeah, we've got plenty of time for questions here. So if you guys have been typing those in the chat, more than happy to take some of those right now. Of course, if you have to head out, no big deal. This will be up on YouTube later, but I'm more than happy to go to some of those questions now if we have them. Thank you, Forrest, for that in-depth presentation. Um, we do okay. have a few questions. And also just to remind you, we hit the one hour mark. So if you knew, if you do need to head out, please do so. And again, you can always refer to the recording at a later time. So let's hop on to the questions we have here. Most plant-based doctors uh, recommend a low fat diet. If someone were to eat healthier fats, such as avocados and nuts, can that be advantageous for someone who is skinny and who's historically struggled gaining weight with exercise? Yeah, that's a great question. And I would say the answer is definitely yes. So if you struggle gaining weight, it means you probably aren't getting in enough calories to get into that surplus like we talked about. 
And so things like avocados and nuts are going to be more calorie dense foods you can eat to help you get into a surplus. And they are still whole foods. And I think it depends on which of the plant-based doctors you're looking at. But a lot of them, like Dr. Greger, for example, just recommend eating whole foods and not thinking so much about, you know, what macronutrients is this and that. And that's a great way to do it from a health perspective. And yeah, that's totally fine if you're eating avocados or you're eating nuts. What I would say is with nuts, have them raw rather than roasted, because if you are roasting them, you're going to be getting some advanced glycation end products in there. It's not going to be as healthy. And so that's one consideration there. Of course, raw peanut butter, eh, it doesn't taste very good. Raw almond butter and stuff like that might be better. But avocados and other of those kind of high fat, higher calorie, still whole foods, totally fine to eat in my opinion. I hope that answers your question. Um, next question we have is, if someone is in a muscle gain, gaining phase, when is, a timely, um, when is it timely to exercise in relation to their meal time? That is a great question. I actually considered talking about meal timing for exercise, but there was so much else to talk about, I had to cut it out. Um, there's a few different times you can do it. So if you're trying to build muscle, you're doing resistance training, uh, it's probably a good idea to time it so that you have some protein and carbs coming in both before and after your workout. So for beforehand, you don't want to eat right before training because then you probably feel full during your workout. You might have some kind of indigestion and stuff like that. Maybe one to two hours beforehand, have a meal that contains some protein and carbohydrates. If it's a smaller, lighter meal or a snack or a smoothie, you can have that closer to the workout. Bigger meal, you might want to allow more time. You can kind of figure this out based on just how you feel. Everybody's a little bit different with digestion and stuff like that. But my recommendation would be one to two hours beforehand, have some protein and carbs. And then it is advantageous to have some immediately following the session as well. And that's why in those meal plans, we saw the post-workout meal there. And again, protein and carbs are what we want to focus on. If you really want to optimize it, you can keep fat a bit lower, lower for the post-workout meal because that will allow the protein and carbs to actually get into your digestion and absorption faster and get into your system faster following training. And so that's going to give you kind of the best outcome there. But even if you have a little bit of fat post-workout, not the end of the world, I would recommend definitely having a good meal, though, close to when you finish your workout. And it doesn't have to be a sit down, you know, big plate of rice and beans in the gym, making a smoothie and taking it with you is a great way to make that easy. And this is also a great question to ask. How much protein does one need per day for general health? Yeah, so the recommendation there is typically going to be a lot lower. I think it depends on you know, your body weight, if you're a man, a woman, stuff like that. But it's probably going to be something like 50 or 60 grams a day or something like that. And that is very, very easy to get on a whole food plant-based diet. If you're eating sufficient calories, it's basically impossible not to get that much protein. Um, and that will be great as far as keeping you healthy, getting all the nutri nu nutrients that you need. and you, know, you won't have any risk of protein deficiency or anything like that. But when it comes to building muscle and maintaining it during fat loss, having a little bit of extra protein coming in does help. Um, and I think this is a great um, related question. If someone wants to maintain their weight so they're not wanting to lose or gain, are there different recommendations as far as food goes, eating whole food plant-based? Well, if you still eat whole food plant-based, that's going to be a great place to start. But you probably don't have to focus as much on either the high energy density or the lower energy density foods that we talked about, just eat a wide variety of foods and just eat when you feel hungry and stop eating when you feel full. And if you do that by eating those healthy whole plant foods, you will typically end up maintaining your weight pretty well because the body naturally will kind of cue you to be hungry when you need those calories and to feel satisfied when you don't. And so that would be my recommendation there. Just focus on food quality, getting in whole foods as much as possible. Don't worry too much about the calorie density of the foods, but if you eat, whole foods and you eat when you feel hungry, stop when you're not, then you're probably going to be on the right track for maintaining your weight. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I think this is a, a, a question um, that, or a situation that affects so many of us with the gyms closed. Do you yeah. have any, um, well, I guess the specific question is, do resistance bands work for building muscle? Yeah, good question. <laughs> I know a lot of us have been using resistance bands lately because that's kind of the only option. I would say they do work to an extent, so they're probably better than nothing, but they are not as good as obviously having access to free weights, barbells and dumbbells and things of that nature. Um, so yeah, if you're working out at home, you don't have any equipment, resistance bands can be a good one to pick up just because they're very kind of 
easy to set up. They're not too expensive. They're not big and bulky and heavy. You can take them with you when you travel and stuff like that. So they're very convenient. They're not the optimal way to build muscle by any stretch, but it does give you some resistance that you can kind of work against, do some resistance training. And they do help for certain movements that are harder to do without equipment or harder to do with body weight alone, like your pulling movements, rows and pull downs and pull ups and things like that. If you don't have a place to do those, resistance bands can be great. And then for your other body parts, you can do things like push-ups and squats and lunges and various core exercises. And those can be very effective to build muscle, even just with the weight of your body alone. Okay. And we have a question about food combining. Mm -hmm. um, do you clarify, Michael? You can also speak in the video if you'd like. Are you here? Yeah, uh, I'm here. Um, oh, yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, yeah just... Um, as far as macronutrients are concerned, um, you know, not mixing certain categories together uh, just for, for efficiency's sake. Um, I've heard that, I'm forgetting the exact order, but I, that keeping, um, I think, fats separate um, allows our liver to not have to store um, versus having complex carbs with the fats, for example, which would cause the liver to store more fat or to, to, to store more, resulting in, in more uh, weight kept, if that makes sense. So what I would say is I wouldn't worry too much about it as far as combining your different macronutrients versus keeping them separate. It's fine to eat meals that contain protein and carbs and fat all in the same meal. And if you think about it sort of from an evolutionary perspective, that's probably more the type of meals that we might have sort of been adapted to eating. Um, as far as kind of keeping fat separate and stuff like that, post-workout is a good time to do that just for the reason that I mentioned. It has to do with allowing the digestion to happen faster. Fat slows digestion, and so you won't be getting the nutrients into your system as rapidly post-workout if you have a lot of fat at that time. But in terms of like the liver storing body fat or, you know, kind of gaining weight or that type of thing, the most important driver there is going to be your energy balance again. And so how you have those meals combined and spaced out and set up throughout the day, that can make a difference, but it's going to be a small difference compared to just, are you in a surplus versus are you in a deficit? That's what's really going to move the needle when it comes to either gaining weight or losing weight or staying the same. And so if you're doing those things, I wouldn't worry too much about kind of separating out your macronutrients just because it'll probably make the diet a little bit more complicated than it needs to be. Okay. Um, so we'll take the two last questions. Um, we have here, what are your thoughts on HIIT workouts? And specifically with the example, uh, kettlebells? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so high intensity interval training or HIIT training, uh, it can be very effective, especially if you have the goal of fat loss. It does burn a lot of calories during the session. And you also get kind of an afterburn effect where your metabolic rate is stimulated and increased for a period of up to 48 hours after training. And so that can be good if you're trying to get into a calorie deficit and lose body fat, doing high intensity interval training works well. One caveat with that, if you're doing really true high intensity interval training, it is really freaking hard. You're gonna feel like you're gonna die. That's kind of how intense it needs to be. Um, and so that's not sustainable for some people, especially depending on what other life stress you have or if you're doing resistance training and stuff like that as well. And so for that reason, you don't have to do high intensity interval training, like true flat out high intensity. It's okay to do some lower intensity, steady state stuff, and you're going to burn calories that way as well. Yeah, you won't burn quite as many calories, but it's much less taxing on your system and must, much less taxing psychologically to do that. And so if you really love doing HIIT works, workouts, absolutely go ahead and do them. For fat loss, they can be great. If you hate doing them, you don't have to do them. You go and do some steady state cardio, go for a walk. Again, make this something that you can sustain long term. So whatever form of cardio you enjoy doing the most is probably the best one for you. Okay. Um, I guess a good follow-up question to that. This is a part two. What sort of resistance training do you recommend for weight gain? Yeah, so this could be a separate presentation in itself, but that might happen at some point in the future. But just kind of a very basic brief version. Of it. Yeah, very brief version. Uh, in order to build muscle, we want to be doing heavy compound movements with resistance training. Compound movements basically means exercises that you're using multiple joints in the body at the same time. So something like a squat, for example, you're using your hips, you're using your knees, your ankles all at the same time, or things like you know bench press, using your shoulders and your elbows. 
a row or a pull down, you're using your shoulders and elbows, using the back. Basically, these types of compound movements are going to engage the maximum amount of different muscle fibers at the same time. And so they give you the best bang for your buck. They give you the best kind of overall systemic disruption where your body's going to say, uh-oh, I've got this stress being imposed on me that this is a lot more than what I'm used to doing. And that's when it feels like it has to adapt and repair and get bigger and stronger. And that's where muscle gain is going to occur. So those types of movements are going to be your bread and natural peanut butter when it comes to building muscle. Okay. And a final question. Um, for someone who eats a whole food plant-based diet, 90% um, of the time and has difficulty losing the weight, is there a calorie range that they should cut? Yeah, that's a good question. So I didn't give specific calorie recommendations in the presentation and I did that on purpose because I don't want people to come away from this thinking, oh, well, Forrest said I need to eat 1500 calories to lose weight. Because the truth is everybody's calorie requirements are going to be a little bit different. And so the best way to figure out what works best for you is to just pay attention to what you're eating. You can use an app like MyFitnessPal to track your diet if you want to. And it sounds like this person is interested in thinking about calories, so they might be open to doing that. Um, but use an app like that, track your diet for a few days or a week, and just kind of see what your calorie intake averages out to. And then, you know, some days will be higher than others, but that's okay. Look at the average calorie intake over the course of a week. And then if you're maintaining weight on that, on that intake, so your weight hasn't changed during the week, then you can say, okay, in order to lose fat, we probably need to go a few hundred calories below this. And this, that could be anything from you know, 300 calories, 500 calories, depends how much you're eating. You don't want to go too radical with slashing a lot of calories right off the bat, because again, you're going to see more metabolic adaptation that way. It makes it less enjoyable and sustainable. So my recommendation, if you know what your maintenance is and you can figure it out using the way I just said, um, take out maybe three to 500 calories below that. And that should get you on the right track to losing weight and losing body fat and try to do that in a sustainable way. Of course, incorporating all the tips we just talked about smashing in tons of those low energy density foods so that you are still going to feel full and satiated with the kind of diet that you're eating. Excellent. Um, well, that concludes our presentation for tonight. And for those who stuck around this late this far, we thank you. And we thank you for your engagement and your questions. And thank you, Forrest, for, for sticking around and giving us such a wonderful uh, presentation. Um, I'd like to just, remind you that, yes, of course. Bit. I just wanted to say one thing before we wrap up. If anybody has further questions or you kind of wanted to chat more about some of this stuff, all my contact details are right here on this slide feel free to shoot me an email or message or anything like that and we can you know discuss these items in more depth today was kind of a broad overview but obviously you can go a lot deeper and that's something that i do with my one-on-one -on -one clients as well um, so feel free to reach out to me via social media email or any of those channels and i'm happy to answer questions there too thank you and um once you see those slides I, i'd be happy to email them out okay yeah um, to remind you that we have an ongoing series although we do have a slight of a slight bit of a hiatus towards the end of the uh, end of the month but we do have an uh, a few more programs coming up on monday we have insights and nutrition notes from a hospital nurse by our uh, ppny brooklyn organizer bonnie helper um, at 7 p.m and we also have our spanish programming on Thursdays, uh, and I believe next Thursday it's at 7.30. Um, and please feel free to uh, visit our website, which I will link in the chat box, and um, follow us on social media, on Instagram, um, Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube. And um, if you'd like to extend this uh, conversation about whole food plant-based nutrition, and please email me at uh, Vivian at pmny.org, which I will also include. And um, once again, thank you so much for attending and happy eating and happy training. Thanks, guys. Bye.